All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the June recap, Fridays with Fiscal Session. We're gonna be reviewing all of the applications, um, June releases. Um, sorry, I was letting somebody in. Hopefully you can see the meetings and trainings page. We'll have the recording here like normal after the session is done. And to find the pages, the page that we're gonna be reviewing with all the applications on one page can be found down below here. And then the appropriate month, which we're gonna be going over June. Now with each um, application, right, yeah. we have links here that will take you to the release notes. Uh, USAS had two releases in the month of June, version 8.48 and 8.49, and we also had two hot fixes. I think I see what the problem is. If you're not muted, could you please um, mute yourself? Unless you have a question, please speak up. Um, the two hot fixes in the month of June for USAS were both in regards to the disbursement print file. <clears throat> the XML file, the first hot fix corrected the bug that prevented the XML file for the disbursement from printing. And then the next hot fix corrected the bug that prevented the account and the description from printing on the disbursement. And then some USAS improvements. Uh, one of them, I'm gonna log in and show you. One of them included the, um, a tool tip that when the district is creating their federal assistant record and they hover over here, this uh, URL for sam.gov was updated. Previously, they had um, like a beta version URL. So when they updated it, we had to update the tool tip. Again, this is not a clickable link. It is provided as a clickable link in the documentation, but a tool tip can't have a clickable link. So it does give you the URL if you wanted to type that in. And then <clears throat> just a note, I learned something new recently that these CFDA numbers are now called ALN numbers, which stands for Assistant Listing Number. I wanted to mention this in case you hear this acronym from the districts. They are the same thing. They both have five digits, but I guess what the districts are now also seeing in the CCIP grant program is those five digits with an alpha character. Now the EMIS manual and the formatting for reporting with our software still requires only the five digits without the alpha character. So currently redesign is only allowing the five digits. Um, so that's the reason why. We do have a JIRA issue. It is USASR 4762 which when the ODE and EMIS filing requirements changed to include this alpha number, um, our documentation, the program will be updated and it'll be called ALN. I have a feeling they're gonna be used interchangeably because CFDA numbers have been around for a long time, but they are the same thing. We also had some um, payable improvements. There was a 60% increase in posting payables, um, like creating the disbursements, a 6% increase posting invoices, and an 18% increase creating purchase orders from those USPS pending transactions. Now keep in mind that additional improvements related to the performance of um, this expenditure process are, are, are the improvements are ongoing. Another improvement which um, includes ongoing efforts 
for you, SAS, were some 1099 improvements. We have a chat that um, from Rhonda that says that several districts have commented on the lack of the alpha character in the CFDA ALN number. Um, Thank you for sending the comments. Hopefully that explains it a little bit better um, about the format and the alpha character. But if you have any questions, just let us know. So the 1099 improvements are ongoing, but one of the things that improved was these reference copies. You can see the whole um, word. And then when you choose those, you now have more choices. But the improvement was on copy B and C, per the IRS, you, are, you can truncate or shorten the ID number, like social security number, but you can only do that on copy B and C. So as soon as you pick copy B or copy C, this box comes up and you can click it if you want to um, not show it on the file and reports. But as you see, if you click on A, because that's not permitted by the IRS, it doesn't show as an option. Um, the PDF copies were formatted for both but NEC and the miscellaneous. And like I mentioned, copy A um, can be found here. This was an uh, improvement by adding copy A. If you look on the IRS website, copy A is not the holder sealer copy, but it looks like this. Um, so it's, it's copy A for the IRS. <clears throat> the same PDF copies that you ran last year are still available. Um, and it's under the PDF format. Keep in mind that this is a work in progress and um, there'll be more improvements and changes in the release notes and we'll update the documentation as well. We also now have the ability to schedule a job to generate these 1099 forms. Let me show you that. So under the job scheduler, when you create, you now have these other options, copy A, copy B, all of the copies or individually cop copies. So once you choose one, um, just like any job, you can use those cron expression generators, I think they're called, um, that's provided in the documentation and schedule it out. You can, like I said, you can do one copy or all, So you can set up separate jobs for each one of those, or you can do one job for all. But either way, you choose to print the forms, um, a copy, whether you're printing them from the menu oops, or scheduling them, um, they'll generate the print forms and a copy will be downloaded for you to print and a copy will also be sent to the file archive. So, and we'll see that later in, when I go to the file archive. So along with these improvements, new parameters were added so that they are populated on the file and in the jobs that print the 1099s. So under system configuration, where we, set up the IRS form submission configuration. What is new is down here. 
the job parameters. So you can apply them, apply your parameters to the documents created by the jobs. And it's these fields that you can update. So when the extract file is created, <clears throat> and you uh, generate submission file, the extract file name was also modified to include a T if it's a test um, submission file or a C for a correction submission type file. These will be saved. Um, they, they will be downloaded and saved in the file archive. So I do have, if you're following along, I do have the names here on the recap page. And I'm going to go into the file archive for the calendar year. And you can see that this file included both types. This file only included miscellaneous and this was only the non-employee compensation file. So I ran it three different times just to show you what the file looked like, but it's like it is in the recap. Now I did not create the test or the, um, this T or the C, which is included, included and it would look like this, but you get the idea of the new file name. Other than that, for USAS, we had a patch to close archived hosting periods that remained for some reason after migration. Um, this was only specific to three districts, so that's been corrected as well as a PO for with items over 10 million for one district. So if, does anybody have any questions for you, SAS? Well, thank you. And now I'm gonna uh, let Lori, or I'm sorry, Andrea share her screen for the USPS side. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. That can, there we go, got it. Okay, we're good. Okay, here we are. Um, okay. So what screen am I sharing? <laughs> I just want to make sure. Yeah, what screen do you see? Do you see um, the demo? The instant. Uh, ABS? Yep. Okay. So it's this one. Okay. I just want to make sure I was on the right one. My two screens. Okay. Good morning. Um, this morning, we're going to be going over the payroll side of uh, the releases. Again, like Pat said, you can find these under the SSD meeting trainings and then under the um, calendar year 22 release cap. So we had two regular this morning or this um, for the month of June. Um, one was on June 3rd and June 17th. And then we had three hot fixes that we did um, June 7th, the 23rd and the 24th. So we'll be going over all those also. But the first thing we'll be going over is our bug fixes. So the first one was um, for future pay. Um, there was a bug when districts were entering, um, going between if they had a miscellaneous pay type um, selected and they wanted to change it like over to overtime pay type. Um, for some reason, uh, that bug was not allowing that rate to update. So when they were saving it, it was not updating it over to the overtime pay the time and a half. So now this has been fixed. So now if they go in between uh, miscellaneous and overtime and go back to miscellaneous, 
Um, the system knows this and it will calculate that rate type correctly now. The next bug fix was on the earnings register. Um, some districts were seeing this. I don't know if all of them were. Um, it was printing them on the earnings register. It was printing, um, I can't really see that, but it was printing um, just dots. It was kind of missing what the abbreviation description was. So with the bug fix, we did now, um, they updated it so it will show up to 14 of the abbreviation. So now it won't um, put just dots in there anymore. So their district should not see that issue anymore on their earnings register. So that was corrected on uh, JIRA 6150. The next one um, for the district in the SOC one audit jobs, um, we had um, concerns that um, USAS was using it, um, that report was being run differently than our payroll side. It was running off the fiscal year 23rd and ours was not. It was being, we were, had them running it during the fiscal year 22. So now they updated that. So now that matches how USAS is ran. So that doesn't get confusing. So now, as long as they're in the current period year of the um, fiscal year 23, which would be July of 2022, now when they run the date range, it's gonna run from the 7121 to the 63022. So now that should match when they run their district in SOC audit jobs. On the next one is um, districts were noticing who use the employee onboarding. Um, if they added a date code um, using the for under the employee option screen, um, they were entering it as a date text. But when they were going to the employee onboarding field under employee, when they were adding new employees, it was showing them just as a text and no date was being entered. So that bug has been created or fixed. So now it's going to show correctly just like this but they were seeing it like this when they were doing the employee onboarding under the employee screen. The next one is the new payroll. This was a hot fix, and this was under uh, the new payroll accounts option under core. Um, it was just a, an odd thing that was happening. Um, sometimes when they were saving it and they go back, they were showing a null over here in the sort options. And, and it was very sporadic. Not every time that we tried to um, test this, it wouldn't happen, but sometimes it would. So they finally figured out what was causing that, and now that is fixed. So now if they don't enter anything in there and they save it, it's just going to show either blank or what they entered. So if they left it blank, it was just putting a null in there for some reason. So that has been corrected, and that no longer is happening. Uh, let see. The next one was the employee onboarding. Um, for some reason, if they were um, adding things and they were just completing it without saving it, completing a task, it was not saving that, um, saving what they were entering. So now they can go in, complete the task, or they can save it, either or. And now those custom fields that they have added will save. And that was a bug that was happening. Um, the next one is the outstanding payables. Um, on the outstanding payable, when they would run it, so if a district voided a check and it was in the same outstanding payables run as the um, regular payroll, and then they voided a check, um, there was a bug where it wasn't showing correctly on the outstanding payables report. So now if a district voids a check in the same run as the outstanding payables when they had it when they ran their original payroll. Now that's going to show the employee was zero all the way across. So it's just a wash. But if they actually do a ran the outstanding payables for that first payable, then they voided the check, then they're going to run out run the outstanding payables for the next run. Now they're gonna see that as a negative so they can get that money back from whatever payroll item deductions that they had from the company. So that was corrected. So now that should show and be, um, look a lot better. This just can understand what's going on with that. 
The next one is the SERS pay report. Um, that was just a bug where there were districts were finding that uh, there were pennies off when they were splitting between um, on the SERS pay report on the um, incorrect rows. So if they were spending between regular and accrued or something on your SERS pay report, um, it was just splitting the pennies in the wrong area. So um, they fixed that. Now we're down to the hot fixes for the bugs. Um, the next one is when they're running the SERS advanced position report, um, for some reason, when if the district already had their new contract set up and activated, and they're running the SERS advanced report after that, um, for some reason it was excluding these those the original fiscal year 22 compensations that should have been being advanced and they weren't. So what was going on, it was not um, looking at the compensation dates at, um, all the time. So now with this correction, when they run it and if they already have their next fiscal year's activated contracts, um, the system's going to first look at that compensation date and say, should it be included? So it's going to look at those start and stop dates now. The next one it was noticed was another hot fix. Uh, this is what the retirement service days. Um, and again, when they had their old compensation dates, calendar um, dates set up, for some reason it wasn't looking at those dates. So now um, when they are checking out the dates, the retirement, um, it will look at what fiscal year you're in. And then if you have the 7121 or the 630 2022. So now anything prior for a calendar start date should not look at anything with a 630 21 date or prior. And it won't count the, any of those days or um, absent days. So, so that was corrected. And another hot fix that we did was on the STRS advance. Um, some districts, we had quite a few actually ITC tickets were coming through where we noticed that the retiree was being split between two lines on the STRS advance report and that shouldn't be happening if they were um, retired the whole fiscal year. Um, and what there was a bug in there that for some reason, um, it was not inflating the gross correctly on the, and, and on the earnings. So now um, when they run that report and they were retired the whole entire year, um, it should be all in one line and inflated gross with the increased compensation if that's set. The next one is some improvements that have been done. Um, Districts were wanting um, to add the remaining pay to the payroll accounts, and that would be under core, under the new payroll accounts. And then when they go in there, they're going to be able to see they added the remaining max amount. So now if they use the max amount type, that they will be able to, excuse me, right here, so this, um, maximum amount, and then they can use this to see what their max is and then we'll deduct um, what is remaining. The next one is the future current expenditure account combo box. Um, this was for wanting, it was being very picky on how they were entering that when they were in the future option in the current. So now when they're entering um, descriptions in to find that code or X reference code, um, they can enter it with uppercase or lowercase, it does not matter now. So if they enter it all uppercase, it will find it and find the general instructions. Even if you type with a capital G and everything else is lower, it will find it now. And same goes for the X reference codes. It will do the exact same thing. So if they have multiple upper and lowercase in the X reference code, they can type it in any way and it will bring it up. So it just saves a little time so don't have to be going back and forth between upper and lowercase. And that would be when they're searching and entering in current and future. The next one is we added to the reports, uh, we added the CSV and Excel option. 
and the PDF was already there. And these have been added to your perfect attendance reports, your ABS 101, and your payment transaction status report. So now they can have the option to run it between these three different reports. The next one was another improvement. Um, they just noticed that a dollar sign was being added under the, um, under the historical position pay report. So under the hours work, there was a dollar sign that was being added. And this is not a dollar or a um, dollar amount field, so it shouldn't be a dollar amount. So they removed that and now that's fixed. So now they're only gonna show it with hours and no dollar sign. Another improvement was under the compensation, districts were wanting um, to be able to delete compensations that have never, they might've created them, but they don't have no historical um, history to them. So now they can delete those. Um, but if they have anything attached to them, they will get an error saying there is historical, uh, um, historical um, information attached and they won't be able to delete them. They'll just be, um, archived. So, um, but the legacy compensations, um, those will, they can't never delete those. So, um, because obviously those come over from um, classics and they probably have historical attached to them. So um, those, you can archive them, but you can't delete them. So again, it's just compensations that have no historical and, and they create it by accident and they want to delete it right away, they can do that and no longer have to archive it and it's always sitting there. So now they can get rid of it, so. The next one is your future pay uh, mass load. Um, there was an update now um, for the Pacific pay accounts that the districts are wanting to mass load. And that is under here. Under mass load and under future. So now when they're adding a specific pay account, this is allowed, they can do this. So now they can either provide the account, the expenditure account X reference um, or the full account code, either or. And when they do that, they wanna make sure they, once, if they're using this, then they have to have these options included in with that mass load. So we added that in here so they know that these four fields have to go with when they're adding the, the specific pay account. So that, um, and also when they're adding that in mass load, they wanna make sure they enter it with no hyphens in between. Um, so what this will do when they're adding it, if that pay account is added to the employer's pay account screen, specific pay, if it doesn't exist already in the pay account for that employee, it will add it. Now, if they are um, updating that account, it will not create a whole new account and then they have three with the same account, but maybe, maybe a different amount. So now the system will see and look and see if they have this original account in the in the um, employee's pay account and it will update it and will not create a new one anymore. So, cause this is, we're seeing where it just kept on adding the same account, but maybe with a different amount. So now that has been fixed. And again, they just wanna make sure when they're doing this to make sure they have these other four options with that. The next one is the surge charge report. This was just an update um, because the compensation did change for fiscal year 22 and now it's 25,000 is the minimum. And again, I included the link here. So if they have questions, we have that right here. The next one is the ABS 103. Um, this was an improvement, and that's uh, one of our new features that I'll be going over. Um, and in this, they just added a quick um, include all employees. That was one option that districts were asking if they can include all employees on the report so they can just run one report with everybody on it. So, so if they check this um, option, um, all employees will be included, um, including ones with no absences. 
and then employees must um, still fall in that report range. So when you're selecting all your options on those reports, um, it just depends on that criteria. Um, we had a, uh, Rhonda had a question, specific pay account is no dashes in text form, correct? Yes. So there should be um, no dashes, I guess, if they, maybe if they have an X reference or in their pay account have the dash, it just has to be entered with no, um, no dashes in there. Okay, thank you. The next one is a direct deposit. Um, we had districts number when you're sorting through, when you're doing your payments processing. Here. And if you need to do a payment and they're processing um, under here, um, when they were selecting, it was saying slash district in here. Um, so we removed that because it just, there was confusing um, a lot of districts of what that district um, option meant. So now we remove that and now it's just the building code number would show. So if they want to sort it, it's just going to show building now and all the district has been removed and any of those um, processing payments options. Um, again, um, for from report options under report for the SERS per pay report, ODJFS report in the SERS per pay report, they added the option also of PDF and now you can run it as CSV or Excel. So now those have um, options have been, um, report options have been added. The next one, um, the districts are asking when you're in attendance mass load, Um, excuse me, mass add, they were wanting to use date shortcuts. So districts that use those date shortcuts, some districts may not use it. And here I have an option of what, or a description under the mass add, under for the date, start and dates, they, I added this under the um, documentation. So now districts that do use the shortcuts, these are allowed. So now if you just entered the Y or R or the fiscal F and L, it would automatically bring that up in there. So let's, let's see if we can do this. Yeah. So now it um, selected everybody. Or selected all the fiscal year. Um, and I'm still in well, old processing, but this is my old files. But I think that's going to be a nice option. It might save time. You know, they don't have to enter in a date or anything. So again, um, you can review this of what is actually um, allowed in the date shortcuts. And again, this is in our documentation. And I added the link right under in our release recap. So if they, anybody wants to go over that. The next one is they include accounts that are active. Um, this is on the report under home. And it's under new contracts, SSC new contracts. Summer report, I believe. I think that's what it was. Uh, new contract pay account, excuse me. Um, right there. So now they have, um, oh, where is it at? There it is. So now when they run this um, report, um, it's only going to show new contracts that are active, or maybe they have a maximum amount entered. So now the system's going to look at those new contracts that are active or have a maximum amount entered. And that's what's gonna print on this report now for new contracts. So again, the maximum pay amount um, must have a maximum of greater than zero. And then the historical amount paid to the account is less than the maximum amounts. So again, this is what our software is checking for. And if the charge percent amount is not equal to zero and the current date of running the report is between the pay accounts and start and stop dates of what they're running. So again, now when they're running this report, um, it's going, going to be looking at active or um, anything with maximum amount entered. All right. 
Um, another improvement was another report that um, districts had sent to us that the new contract summary report, which is located, I believe, under SSDT. Yep, right here. When they were running that, they were getting a dollar sign again um, by the work days. So that was just a bug and they took that, improved that and removed that. So now when they run that report, they won't see a dollar sign by the work days anymore. Okay, any questions on bug fixes or improvements before I go to the new features of the ABS 101 and 103? Okay, so the next ones are the ABS 101 and the ABS 103 that we added for report options to be ran. So the ABS 101, um, this will be your staff attendance reports, and it's going to list like attendance and absent categories by the employee, by the date. And again, it's gonna show the day of the week that the activity occurred, um, the length, and also it can show the subcategory. And again, the report now will show um, total by category for the number of records, days, hours, weeks on the PDF report only. So we're gonna go to this. Here we go. And that is under reports attendance and ABS 101. I will go through this one first. So this report um, has several options that they can use to run the report. So now they have the option to run it by those three different report formats. They have an option to run it by several different sort by options. Quite a few there that they can run by. I'm just gonna run it by employee name. And then the begin date and the report title, those are two that have to be entered um, to run the report. So again, I'm in old, I have old, my old files, my demo files are old, so I just had to start it with an earlier date so I can get some data on my file. So you enter the date that the district is looking for. Now, if they wanna include employee numbers on the report, they can do this also. Maybe they don't want the employee numbers on the report, then they can uncheck that. Otherwise it will be checked. And again, if they hover over those boxes, it will display a description of what that field is for. So that would be very helpful. And again, I put this all in the documentation. So if there's any questions, um, you can definitely go back to that also. The next one is include substitute for employee numbers on report. So if you want to include, if you want to, if districts use and they use the substitute for the employee numbers, if they use that option and enter those in for their employees that are absent, um, they can have that show on the report also. If they don't want to, then they can just leave that unchecked and that will not um, print on the report anymore. The next one is your job status. Again, you can run um, job status for those um, compensations for employees that are active, inactive, deceased, or um, for any job status of those employees. You also have the appointment type um, if you want to run it just for certified employees or classified. Days of the week, maybe you want to see um, everybody that worked on, maybe it was a holiday or something or a Thursday, you want to see who worked. You can run that and only pull in those employees that actually worked on that day. So you have that option to do that. Also, if you leave a blank, it will just pull in everybody on that day of the week, every day. The next one is include only records with substitute for assigned. So maybe a district um, uses this and they want to see if any um, records were entered with no substitute being assigned to them. And so they can keep track um, of what was not being entered. Um, they have that option to do that now. So it will include only records with no substitute for the assigned. On the next one is include only records not reported to USAS. Um, so what this is, and I have a Word document because I had to use it with a different district um, because I don't have it in mind. So what that is, oh, sorry, that was the wrong one. Yeah, that's the next one. If, let me bring this in. Okay, so I'm bringing another screen so I don't have to get off of that one. 
Now, if you go to um, attendance, which I'm in under core, and if you go to this USAS posting indicator right here, this is what that field is looking at. Now, a lot of districts may not use this because this is associated with the leave projection. So if they use the leave projection, then this is going to be checked every time when they create the file and they run it through the um, USAS and they run it and um, create it and then run, I don't have it under that one, the lead projection submission. So once I click on that, that is going to change that flag and check it. So now if a district uses that option for lead projection and they wanna make sure everything's been reported to USAS, they can go ahead and now use this um, checkbox here to include only records that have not been reported. So they can keep a track on maybe something that was missed. Um, so they know what hasn't been um, reported to USAS using the lead projection. And again, I have this under documentation um, detailed out so they can see that of what that field actually is and what it is using. All right. So again, I have that right here. So if you have any questions, forget what that is for. That is what it's looking at. Is that on the attendance screen? Okay. The next one, the deferred status option. Um, now, this is only for districts. And I had to find a district that actually used it. So here is one. Um, if they have in their configuration, that deferred absent posting checked. So this is for districts that use this. Now districts don't, that don't use this option don't have to worry about that box. They can just disregard it. Um, but this is what um, that box is looking at. So if they're looking at that and they have just deferred absent posting checked, and then when they run it, I ran a report in, a, in, my, in one of uh, district's files. Um, I activate, had active employees only and I included deferred option of include only deferred records. So right here, this is what I had checked when I ran it. And when I did that, this is what the report looked like. So it's only showing employees that had deferred um, absence. And what that is looking for when I counted those up, it matched exactly what it showed under the employees leave sick. And that's when this unapplied usage is being used. Again, the unapplied usage is only used if they're being if their district is, is using that deferred absent posting. So that's just a reminder on that. And again, I have that in the documentation of what that deferred status. If again, if only if the districts are using that. Okay. So the next one. I'm not going to check that. Um, now, your next one is your specific transaction types. Now you have available. So now you, if you click on it, you can double click or you can bring it over by the arrow, either or. So again, if they just want to check everybody that has absences on the report, they can do that. Same thing goes for specific category. If they want to go down even more, they can do um, either of these that are available. The next one, subcarry. Um, maybe not all districts use that subcategory. Um, so if they do use it, and let's see if I can find, there it is. So that would be um, when they're entering, and right here. So if they use this when they're entering their attendance for subcategory, um, and they can go ahead and look for bring in employees that have that subcategory now. And what they wanna do is separate it by commas. So when they enter it, maybe they're just using EA comma CA, TA. Um, so whatever, how they use their subcategory, they just wanna make sure they put it in by comma and they'll just bring in those employees that have that subcategory. The next one is specific building. And again, another one is specific departments they can um, run the report by. And also they can do a pay group. So if they just wanna check a certain pay group and run it by for those employees, they can do that also. 
or they can run it by an employee. And again, they can search by the, the employee ID number, or they can by the last name or the first name. So I curated, um, nope, I don't think I actually did one for ABS. So let me go ahead and create one. So um, I'm just gonna create it for everything so you can see what the report looks like. And I'm just doing it for active employees. So I'll go ahead and create that. Hopefully it won't take too long. Thought I had one created for ABS 101, but. She's taking too long. Okay. I was looking to see if I had one ran, but I didn't. So, oh, yes, I do. Here we go. I'll bring that over. Make sure. Yeah. There it goes. Oh, that's my favorites. I'll probably put my okay, here's one. This is this is a C, this is a CSV, but this is what CSV would look like. So it just reports, it has your employee name, number, building, employee name, date, um, the day of the week will be in there, the length, the daily, what the unit code is, um, what kind of type it is, and the category. And again, if you use subcategory or, or deferred or sub four, four, that would be entered in there. So that's just kind of an example of what the ABS1 report is. So. Um, I think it's going to be pretty nice. I think this is sort of definitely like that. Any questions on the ABS 101 report before I miss uh, go to the ABS 103 report? Okay. The next one is your ABS 103. And this one is going to be for your staff attendance summary report. Um, it's going to summarize the employee's absence and attendance, and then also uh, it will give a grand total at the end of the report. So we'll go through that one. So this one, um, again, um, the report, you need a report title. Again, they can change that if they're running it for a certain um, time frame. They can enter in that so they can keep track of when they ran it. Again, they have a report format of CSV, Excel, or PDF. And again, same thing, sort by. Employee number, name, department, and building, your pay group, building, or department. Let's do name. Include subtotal by selected sort option. So if you want it to subtotal every by every employee name, or if you want to do it by a building um, code or a department, you can have that option on the report now. So if they have that to include the subtotal, then that um, it will do a subtotal for each sort by of um, whatever you have it entered here. So by employee name, it's gonna sort it and put a subtotal for every, after every name. The next one would be a page break. So if you want a page um, and one employee name on every employee, you want a separate page, you can have that option now and by checking the page break by selected sort option. And again, it's looking at the sort by whatever you have it entered here. Again, the begin date, that needs to be entered. So they wanna make sure they have a date started on there. And, and, and they can leave the end date and it'll just probably go to what today's date is. So really doesn't need one, but you can do an end date if you're doing a certain um, dates. Again, if you want to include archive employees on the report, you have that option. Include all employees on the report. 
And again, this is that one that was added in the improvement. Um, it will include um, employees with no absences. So it's going to be employees with absences and no absences. So that includes everyone on there. The next one, if this is checked, um, the employee numbers will print on their report. If they don't want to see that, they can uncheck this flag. Again, they can run the report by certain job statuses, by certain appointment type, and by a category. Now, I can only run it by one category. So if they want to do sick indication, um, that's an option right now to run multiple or like a few at a time. So they would have to select one. But if they want to um, select everything, every category, then they can leave that blank. And as you see, if you click sick, then these two boxes come out. So just like in classic, you have the option now to run this report under a number of days. Um, so if you entered one, any employee that has one day or less is gonna show on that select a category. So anybody with a sick of one day or less of usage will show on this report now. And again, goes if the district goes by hours, they can um, also have that option now too. So now they can keep track if they wanna See anybody that use less than one and for bonuses, they can do that. For um, same thing as ABS 101, they can run this by building, by department, select a pay group, and they also can run it by one employee. And I already ran their report, so that way, just in case it doesn't take too long. So here is what I was saying, like I have employee name, number and I put the sort option to be true. So here's what you're seeing is it, it's doing a subtotal at um, in page break or like employee summary under each one. So that's what that would look like if you did the, um, include subtotal by selected sort options. And this was just for sick. Okay, wait, I'm to my report, there it is. And so you'll see every employee on here. And then way at the bottom, we'll give you um, a total of the sick. Uh, and if you had other two, so it just gives you a report summary way at the bottom. Okay. Um, is there any questions on these two reports? Again, um, definitely the documentation, um, try to add everything in there that would be helpful on how to run it. So again, if you have questions, you definitely can look at the documentation or you can um, let us know. Okay, um, that was all for the payroll for uh, bugs and improvements and new features. Is there any questions on any of everything that we went over or wanna see again? Okay. And um, then I will hand it over to Michelle and she's going to do, I believe, the inventory releases. <clears throat> Thanks, Andrea. And then I will stop sharing. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So you should be able to grab it now. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, <clears throat> uh, TGIF. So, <laughs> and uh, I'm on vacation next week. So that makes you know, Friday even better for me. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to cover um, what happened uh, regarding inventory in June. Um, we only had one release in June, and that's because we needed to get back onto the same schedule that payroll and USAS were on so that all releases were happening the same two weeks. Um, so that's why we had to push back uh, a week in order to get back on that schedule with USAS and payroll. So that's why we're only seeing one release and we did have a hot fix. Um, so to cover this information here, before I do that, just want to make sure I have my chat open here. Okay. Um, so um, we had um, a few bug fixes that we needed to take care of. And uh, what I did is I just put in here at the beginning uh, where the bug fix was at. So in dispositions, um, we fixed it to prevent users from posting disposition transactions that already have dispositions. Um, so they were able to double post dispositions for the same tag. 
So we fix that on the 118 to prevent that. And then on the items grid, um, we were um, fixed it to prevent modifying the least type field when viewing an item. So you weren't in edit, you were in, a, in the view mode and it allowed them to change the least type field. So we fixed that to um, only allow them to edit that least type field when they are actually in edit mode. Um, with the gap reports, we had a few things that needed to be fixed. Um, the fixed asset by source report uh, was excluding items without an acquisition and items that also had an entity ID. So um, this was showing up on balancing issues when people were trying to migrate and their 101 report wasn't matching their fixed asset uh, by source report. So um, we corrected that. The uh, schedule of change in fixed assets, the summary, uh, when running it for function and asset class was corrected to handle items with null funds. Um, if these, there was like a specific situation, if these items had dispositions, an error occurred and the report failed to generate. Uh, so we made that uh, fix on there on 118. And also the schedule of change and depreciation report, it was including dispositions with blank dates um, and so we corrected that as well. So these were all found when um, balancing against the classic reports. And I know that I've had a couple of tickets come through just yesterday uh, with people being unable to run, um, I believe the fixed asset by source. And I think uh, the schedule of change in fixed assets summary by fund only, they were getting that can't, can't generate the report message, it just kind of dumped them out of it. And so we are looking into that right now to see what is causing that. It's not the same that I'm aware of, not the same issues we had before that we fixed. So there's some little glitch or something um, that's not allowing those reports to generate. And it's gotta be some specific edge case because I can generate it for others. So, um, so we're looking into that right now. Um, I have posted on the tickets that, um, you know, we're, the developers are looking into that today. So hopefully we'll get that resolved soon. Um, the 118 <clears throat> release did cause an issue regarding the lease type uh, to be populated when adding or modifying an item. Um, so it's when we had the 118 release out there, once we released that, people were going in and adding items, and it was requiring a lease type when, they, it, wasn't a, when it wasn't a lease. So um, we um, had to fix that um, in order to remove that requirement. And that was, I believe, part of the hot fix um, that we took care of that. So you should be able to enter items without any issues, and it shouldn't prompt you for a lease type anymore. Um, with dispositions, the 118 also caused an issue when creating dispositions. What was happening is that it was not updating the cost disposed of. So I'm gonna go into my instance here. And when I go in to create a disposition, um, you know, I'm pulling in the item. And when I pull in the item information, the item that I wanna dispose of, it will populate a lot of these fields. It'll populate the fund function and asset class from the item. And it will also populate the disposed of, which is the original cost of the item. That should get populated. Well, what was happening is that it was only posting a zero, even though that original cost was say $250. So um, we, on the hot fix, we fixed that. So going forward, it will take care of that. But if there were uh, dispositions that were created between the 118 release and when we did the hot fix, they will have to fix, fix those manually. And so we have the steps here on how to do that. And that was um, included in the release as well. But so if there are any dispositions, you can easily filter by going to the disposition grid and finding those that were created in between that time frame that have a zero um, disposed of cost. 
And so what can easily be done then is you just extract those out on the disposition grid using, I'll go back here, using the export grid items. So you're gonna filter those, export them out. And then all you need to do is just save that CSV file and import it back in using the system import disposition option. And that will go in then and fix those and update those that had a zero cost dispose of and put in the correct original cost of that item. So that is explained here um, in our recap and it's also explained on the release notes on how to do that. Um, so that uh, were the, that's the bug fixes that took place in June. Um, we also had a couple improvements. We got the audit report out there. Our programmers are feverishly working on fiscal year end. Um, not all the fiscal year end reports and uh, functions are available yet. And I'm gonna talk about that here in a little bit. Um, but um, we did get the audit report out there. So I wanna show you what that looks like. Um, with the audit report, we have both the demand and official options. So without further ado, take you in there. And it is listed obviously alphabetically underneath the reports. And so um, these are the options that you're going to see. So first off, you're going to see a demand and official. Now, these aren't going to work like, um, well, especially the official doesn't work like it did in Classic. When you ran the official report in Classic, in the EIS 801 report, the audit report, it did not give you any options. It just ran it based off the last time you ran the official report. So if a district ran the official report yesterday, didn't do any transaction processing today, and went in and ran the official report again today in Classic, they wouldn't get a report because nothing happened in the system between the two times they ran that official report. That's not how it's gonna work in redesign. Um, the demand and official report are very similar. Um, the main difference between the two is that the official report has the signature block at the end that the treasurer can sign off on. So um, let me take you through these here. So with the demand, which is the default, um, you have <clears throat> some options here. You can, for one, um, and you could run the demand and the official as many times as you need to. Um, so the demand, um, you can enter in a specific tag number or tag numbers. I believe you can put a comma in between the tag numbers and it will go out there then. And if you put in a specific tag, you don't put anything else in any of the other fields. It will default by tag number, that's the default sort. And it will pull in anything that was audited or anything that would happen to that tag um, since, if you don't have to put in a date range, since the beginning of time. Um, so um, we are going to tweak this one a little bit. When we were out there and doing further testing on it, um, we felt like if they put in a tag number, really the rest of these are kind of irrelevant because they could have a tag out there that they went in and modified multiple times um, on different days. They went in and add several additional acquisition trans transactions against it in different years. They could have posted a transfer transaction or several of them in different years. So if we wanna see everything about that tag number, um, it's really hard to put in a date range when you don't know when all the changes were made. So um, once we get that in place, uh, once you enter in a tag number in there or tag numbers, I believe the rest of these are gonna be grayed out and it will just go out and produce that report um, for <clears throat> all things that happen to that tag number. Um, it does, you'll notice that the start and stop dates are in red. And so you have to put in a start and stop date when you're using the demand option in, um, and in order for the generate button to even appear. So you don't see the generate underneath here at all. I have to put in a beginning date and then it will start, you know, it'll actually go in then and an end date. And then the generate button will populate. 
Um, so obviously, um, this is a um, timestamp date, okay? So it's not the date that you, you know, entered in as the acquisition date for a tag. It's timestamp because it's an audit report. Um, so if you want to find anything that was done that was entered in the system from July 1st through June 30th, you are going to put in that date range here and it will generate a demand report or an official report of everything that's happened. What's really nice about the audit report compared to Classic, Classic only audited um, the uh, transaction, the uh, item screen, disposition screen, transfer transactions, and acquisition transactions. It didn't audit anything else. It didn't audit anything underneath um, the uh, like the fund codes and you know adding locations and stuff like that. It didn't audit when you ran the EIS CAP program. It didn't do any of that. Um, this audit report does. So it's basically auditing whatever's happening underneath core transactions. I don't think it audits when reports are run, so we'll skip that one. And underneath system. So what it's doing is, um, and I think I, I believe I have that documented. I'm gonna pull up the documentation here, show that to you. So I've got a reports and the audit report. And so um, in here, um, one thing I wanted to point out is that it's the uh, listing of things you can audit on, which is going to be the next thing I was going to discuss is listed here. So if I go back and go to select report type, it's going to show me all of those items I just said that are going to be audited. So when you're looking down here and you're like, okay, I can do an audit report on all the location codes I've entered. And you know, if I put in a fiscal year date range here in the past fiscal year, um, I can go in and see all the users' accounts that were created in the past fiscal year. But I don't see where I can audit on the capitalization criteria. Um, that's not an actual option I can select on. Well, it is being audited. But when you think about that, it's updating the fiscal, it's updating the cap criteria that's found underneath or fiscal years, and it's also updating all of those items to whether they're going to still be capitalized or non-cap. So that would be under, you know, the items information. So you're still, even if they ran the cap criteria and changed it from $1,000 to $5,000, you're not going to see it as an option to audit on, but if you run the report for the year, you're going to see underneath core fiscal years that the cap, the um, dollar and life limits changed. It used to be, you know, $1,000, and now you see that it was changed to $5,000. Same thing with the transactions underneath, you know, when you're looking at the report, you'll see it underneath items. It was, the status was capitalized, and now it's non-capitalized. So you are going to be able to see it. It's just not you know, a specific thing that you can select on. Same thing goes with the import option. Um, you can't do a report type on imports and run an auto report on imports. These imports are affecting all the different fields or options underneath core and transactions. So if I went in and did a mass update on locations, um, then it's going to show up underneath transactions, underneath the location, the location changed for that item. It used to be room one and now it's room two. So it's gonna show up underneath the items. Or if I added a bunch of um, new locations, it's gonna show, show up underneath core locations on the report. It's not, you know, there isn't like an actual import option underneath report types. So I hope that kind of, better explains that most of these, what you're, what you're finding underneath core and transactions are listed under the report types. But if you're wanting, like I said, to go in and say, well, what about my cap criteria? It's, it's on the report. It's just not an option you can select. 
um, uh, users is actually though. So that one, you know, you will be able to find that one underneath here. So you can see that you can get pretty specific in here, which is what I really like about this. So if I want to run a demand report of um, the items that I entered within the past month timestamp, I can go in and put in, you know, that month's uh, date range, and I could go ahead and select items, and it will go in then and generate a report for just that timestamp month of what was added or what was modified or what was deleted. Um, so that information is going to show up on the report. Um, <clears throat> select users will allow me to go in and generate a report based on that specific user and what they've done in uh, the inventory application. Uh, my sort options, um, right now we just have date, tag number, and username, and I believe the default sort is date. So if you don't select something, um, it's going to sort by the timestamp, by the date. Um, so that's kind of what the official, or I'm sorry, the demand options do. And the official option is going to work the same way. Um, it's going to provide the same options. Um, and it's going to generate then a report with a signature block down at the bottom that they can sign off on. Now we did discuss this with the auditors because this works differently than it did in Classic. Like I said, Classic, it didn't give them any options. It just ran the report. And then um, when they run it again, it's going to just show what was done between those two runs. So in here, they can be selective. So, um, they were fine with how this behaved. We went through the behavior. So I said, if they want to run an official report um, for the month of July on just location codes, it's going to let them. And so, and they they were not wanting to be restrictive. Um, they didn't feel like it was you know their place to say how it has to be. Um, we just the districts just need to be you know, cautious about how they run this. And so what I did on the fiscal year end checklist is if they're going to run the official report, um, I just put in a recommended way of running it. So obviously if they want to generate an official report of everything that happened in the application for the entire year, they would obviously run an official report put in from July 1st of 2022 to June 30th of 2023. Um, not select any report types, and then not select any specific users. And if they want to leave the date sort um, as the default, they wouldn't put anything in here. And they would just generate the report. And it will contain everything that happened on the system for the entire year with a signature block at the end that they can sign off on. Um, so that's basically how this report works. And so this is all, you know, documented um, in here. Um, I think we're going to add a little bit more. Um, this is pretty new, so we may have to tweak this a little bit, but um, the documentation is out there. And if I go to our fiscal year and checklist, which is under our appendix, it's also included as a step in here as well. And so, um, and we do have the recommendations on how to run the official. They can run the um, demand report as many times as they want. So, um, but the official report, if they just want to run it once a year, this is a rec recommended way to do that. Any questions about the audit report? Okay. Um, I'm going to get back to the inventory fiscal year and checklist in a little bit, but I just want to talk about the last thing that was done um, as an improvement on the 118 release is we did uh, provide a select all box um, on the items grid, which is really nice. Um, so when I'm in items, you'll notice now that it has a select all. This select all is really meant for the depreciate option. So if I am going in and filtering, whatever I filter on, and I want to recalculate depreciation on whatever I filtered on, 
once I do my filtering, I can select the check all. It's only going to select what I filtered on. It's going to select them all, the ones that I filtered on. And then I can use the depreciate option to recalculate depreciation on those. So I don't believe this is tied with anything other than the depreciate button. Um, we also did that a little while ago on the pending items too. We did a, we included a select all in there as well. So, um, so based on feedback we got from everybody, um, we made sure that we added those. That covers what we did um, in June. Um, July is going to be pretty busy because we'll have three releases coming out. Um, we had the 119 go out on the first or whatever that first Friday was in July. Um, and then we have um, two others coming out. So we've got, um, pull up my calendar here. We have got the, so 119 went out on the first. Uh, 120 will go out on the 15th, so that's next week. And then um, 121 is going to go out on July 29th. Now, the, one fifth, the, the 15th, the 29th, and that first release in August are focusing on fiscal year end, getting the rest of these fiscal year end steps out here. Um, districts can close out. But um, there are some things that aren't available yet. So if you've got a district that is wanting to close out for fiscal year 22, they can, but we don't have the inventory report bundle ready yet. So they would have to run, generate all the reports manually and store them somewhere on their um, computer. Um, if they want to wait and not close out until that stuff's out there, um, they can leave 22 open, and they can open 23 if they want to start processing in 23. Now, a big concern with that, though, is they didn't close 22. So life to date can't be calculated, and beginning balances can't get updated. So that's a big note for them to know that if they are going to keep 22 open, they open 23, and they start processing, which is fine. But then they run a report, and that report includes life to date amounts or beginning balances, um, like the gap reports. They're not going to be updated. It's not, they're not going to be correct because it's not going to reflect the life to date from 22 on there yet. Um, obviously, if they close 22, it'll update it accordingly. But um, I just, you know, I want to make that known that, you know, those aren't going to get updated if they decide to leave 22 open. If they want to close fiscal year 22 and they don't run these reports, that's okay because once the inventory fiscal year and report bundle is available, and that will not be available until the 122 release, um, they can close out for fiscal year 22, start processing in 23. And when that uh, report bundle is released, they can go back, open 22 back up, close it, and their inventory report bundle will be generated for 22. So that will be out there then. Um, so lots of different things that they can do. Um, I don't want to tell them that they can't close, um, but those are, you know, the different options for them if they, um, feel like they have to close now. I know a lot of districts do not close until later. They may not close until September or October or until after their auditors are there. And they may not you know, be doing any processing for 23 yet either until their auditors are there. And that's fine. All of this should be available then for them when they get to that point. So if their auditors aren't coming until October, no problem. All of this will be in here and then they can go and close out with all of these options um, and uh, you know, start processing for 23. That's just really up to the district on uh, what they wanna do. Um, so I have um, updated the checklist just to include in red the things that are pending. So um, there are a couple reports um, in uh, the EIS close program that closed inventory and classic. It created two reports. 
Um, so now those are going to be kind of like pre-closing reports now. Those are being worked on and they are both um, scheduled for the 121 release. So that 121 release will go out at the end of July, July 29th. Um, the fiscal year end report bundle is the other thing that um, is not out there yet. And this will not go out until, unless that changes, this will not go out until mid-August, the report bundle. Um, so this will, I believe, I, I don't know the details of it, but I'm assuming that the report bundle is going to include all the reports, recommended reports here that they uh, uh, can run. So that bundle should include all of this from what I understand, including these two new reports. Um, let's see. And then there is um, some changes that are gonna be made to um, the gap options. So like I know most of you that have migrated your districts over, they're already on gap. They have their gap flag checked. Um, so that's not an issue for you guys because they're already good to go. But if you have districts that aren't on gap, that do not have their gap flag checked, they didn't have it checked in classic, um, they migrate over and they want to enable the gap and, and be on gap for the new year, we do have um, some changes we're making um, to the configuration screen or enable the gap option, which will then set the beginning balances. So for those of you also that are starting new in redesign that aren't migrating over, and you wanna go in and start entering items, I know that we've had you guys hold off on that, and this is one of the reasons why, is if those districts want to have their gap flag set, we have to get this ready for them before they can start processing. Um, so these are going to be, this is scheduled to be included on the 122 release as well. Um, so I just kind of wanted to give you guys a little update on what is going on with the inventory fiscal year and checklist. Um, obviously, if you guys have any questions, please don't hesitate to create tickets and we'll get those answered for you. But I just kind of wanted to let you know where we were at with that. Any questions? Okay, I do have one other thing I wanted to ask you guys. We wanted your feedback on something. Um, on our um, release recaps, we are providing um, quite a few screenshots just to help you guys see like before and after or you know, to see that new feature um, and how it looks. Um, our biggest concern is, um, is, are the screenshots making the recap too long. Do you prefer the screenshots, leaving them in here and you don't care about the length because you like the screenshots? Or do you feel like, you know, we should remove them because we're explaining them anyways um, during the presentation? So if you want to post it in chat, keep screenshots, get rid of screenshots or, or comment, you know, um, um, we would appreciate that because we don't want to be, you know, doing any, you know, if you don't like the screenshots, we don't want to have to include those in here. So let me know. I've got one person already saying I prefer the screenshots. So, all right. So people are saying they like them. So, um, okay. I think we've made our decision. <laughs> um, keep screenshots um, so that if someone reads the document, then they have the detail. So we'll, you know, be careful about, you know, trying to keep minimal as we can so it doesn't get too crazy. Um, but if you guys like these before and after shots or just shots on them, uh, we will leave them on there. Okay, I think we've made our decision. Thanks for the feedback. Okay, I don't think there was anything else I needed to cover with you guys today. So we appreciate um, you guys listening in and um, thank you. And we will see you guys here in a couple of weeks. Have a good weekend.